All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, really excited. Uh, we've got a little special little show for you tonight. Uh, we're going to be doing a uh, presentation on fossil fuel divestment. Uh, before I started doing these YouTube uh, uh, open window sessions, uh, I was approached by uh, a wonderful man, uh, Colin Suchulam, who uh, approached me to do a webinar for uh, CAPE, the Canadian Association of Physicians uh, for the Environment. So uh, Colin is a member of Ontario CAPE, and uh, really what we wanted to do was basically create a forum for people who are interested in uh, fossil fuel divestment and for me to do a little presentation and then you know to host it online because you know really it is doctors all over the province all over the country you know a lot of different people uh, from a lot of different places realized we couldn't host it in person so we started kind of coming up with this idea of doing it live and doing it as a webinar um, we had picked this date not knowing that there was going to be this massive market meltdown and the coronavirus situation. So, you know, really want to uh, uh, acknowledge that these are really tricky times right now. And wanted to say a big thank you to all the doctors and the, the, the medical professionals who are working right now. Um, you know, I think it's, I'm kind of in awe. I know this notion that like, you know, don't call us heroes, we're doing our job or, you know, support the government to, uh, uh, and support governments that are gonna look after our doctors and our healthcare professionals a little bit better. And, you know, certainly uh, that's something I'm really taking to heart at this moment in time. So thank you so much for the work that you do in general, but also uh, for the work that you're doing right now during this crisis. Um, so really, really excited to be here, uh, excited to have this little chat. Uh, the way I'm gonna do it is I do have a little presentation for us probably about 20 slides. My guess is gonna be about you know 45 minutes uh, to go through this if I take my time. I'm really hoping that you will add your questions during the chat. So I'm gonna keep my eye on the chat here. Uh, hopefully you should be able to see it as well. And that uh, if you have questions, don't be shy, throw them in. If you have comments, if you like what I'm saying, if you don't like what I'm saying, then by all means, you know, put it in the chat. Uh, uh, I'll get to as many of the questions as I possibly can during the presentation. And then after the presentation, that's when we really can open it up. That if you want to dive into specific areas or get into the weeds, so, so happy to do that. So there will be kind of like a bit of an open format. Uh, what I will ask is if possible, let's try to keep things uh, specifically focused on divestment that really I do think this is sort of like a, a divestment seminar. So I'm gonna do my absolute best to try to keep things uh, focused as much as possible on that topic. Happy to go off topic a little bit, but as much as possible, let's try to keep it to divestment, knowing that I'll be back next week. Uh, I've been doing these uh, YouTube Lives every Thursday at 7 p.m. Toronto time. And if you have questions about other things, then you know uh, I'll be able to get to those next week. Um, so before I jump into the seminar, uh, I do want to do a, sort of an acknowledgement here that really to be in a position where we're talking about investing right now uh, is really a place of privilege. That, you know, these are, this is the data that I used uh, from last year. So obviously with the crash and with so many people losing their jobs right now, uh, these numbers are going to be worse than they were last year. But to be clear, you know, the, in Canada, the household median income is $57,000. This is household. This is not for one person. This is the median income for households. And I want to be clear that a third of Canadians don't have an RSP or a TFSA, meaning that they really have no investments uh, whatsoever. So, you know, really to me, understanding that, that to talk about investing at all does come with some degree of privilege. The, the fact that, you know, we've got investments, we've got RSPs and TFSAs, you know, really puts us ahead of a lot of Canadians, certainly most Canadians. And that, you know, even right now, uh, due to the, the, the pandemic, so many people are going without work, so many people have had their hours cut, and that really, you know, we are in an even more privileged time right now to be talking about this. So I just want to be aware of that 
and you know kind of highlight it right at the start. Um, also want to acknowledge that sustainable investing uh, is not a panacea. This is not a silver bullet. That really this is not going to be the the one thing to solve us all. That you know really if we if we do, do sustainable investing that we don't need to do anything else. No no no. Individual actions matter. So it matters what you do and the businesses you support and how you conduct your life. Uh, governments matter. So uh, you know vote, get engaged politically. Uh, all these different advocacy uh, things work. That really this is I would say another tool in our tool belt. That if we're trying to take action on climate change, um, then uh, uh, sustainable investing is going to be another tool that we can use to be able to further that change. And as I'm going to argue in this presentation, I happen to think it's a very, very powerful and effective tool, but I'll get into that a little bit later. Now, I think a lot of you know who I am. That, you know, if you've been here, if you've been following along, uh, if you are a client, then you know who I am. I don't need any introduction. But assuming that we do have some new audience members here, I uh, just want to give a quick little background on me and sort of who I am. Uh, so I uh, grew up with my father in the investment industry. I'm from London, Ontario. So I sort of grew up around stocks and bonds. Um, I studied economics out at Dalhousie. I did my undergrad in econ. I took philosophy courses whenever I could uh, as electives. And it was really in my third year that light bulbs started going off in my head. Not so much light bulbs, but more problems that I started realizing how messed up our economic system was. And I started asking some really, really tough questions. Uh, I ended up graduating with my BA in economics with way more questions than I had answers. So I went to Sweden and I did my master's in sustainability, this program called uh, a master's in strategic leadership towards sustainability. I learned all about systems uh, thinking. Uh, I learned about uh, uh, social and environmental issues. Um, uh, took a course called engineering for a sustainable society about all these different green technologies. And then as well, I, uh, I did uh, uh, my thesis looking at this topic of socially responsible investing. Um, that was back in 2008, 2000, 2007, 2008. I completed my master's, published my thesis, uh, came back to Canada in July of 2008, ready to take the investment world by storm, and obviously graduated right into the biggest crash since the Great Depression. So I was sort of shit out of luck there. There were no jobs available for me whatsoever. So uh, I started my own business and realized that, you know, really sustainability was put on the back burner uh, after that first uh, uh, economic crisis that, that we went through and uh, just kind of started doing my own thing. Uh, you can see here in the slide, uh, um, you know, basically fighting dragons since 2010. This was my first appearance ever on national TV was going up against Kevin O'Leary on the Lang and O'Leary exchange uh, talking about uh, green investments. Uh, you can see here sort of baby Tim, fresh face. I got a really short haircut because I was like, I don't want them to call me a hippie, you know, so I made sure I had a really tight haircut, wear a nice suit. And uh, really since then, uh, uh, I've been uh, doing a lot of work in this field. Uh, I've been through a few different iterations for my business. Talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but the latest incarnation is that uh, my company is called Good Investing. Let me just bring up my homepage here, give myself a little shout out. Um, and that basically what I do is uh, I offer uh, financial coaching, investment coaching for do-it-yourself investors, for people who care uh, about the world and the planet and other people on it and who want to align their investments with their values. So um, that's where I'm at right now. Uh, I did just pass my CFP final exam. So that was back in November. I'm waiting on a little bit of paperwork to be processed. They need to verify my history, but very soon I will get my CFP designation. I'll be a certified financial planner and uh, working with clients to be able to help them really on this topic of sustainable investing. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. If you do have more questions about me or my background, you know, by all means, throw them in the chat. But otherwise, uh, let's get into the presentation. Uh, so really what I want to start with is, uh, I don't know if anyone was paying attention this week, but uh, oil prices uh, did something absolutely remarkable on Monday. Uh, oil prices went negative for the first time ever. So this was a historic moment 
when oil prices went negative and it got all kinds of press and all lots of buzz everyone was talking about it so really before we talk about divestment i think it is important to understand the context of the moment in history that we are in right now so i'm going to take a few minutes to be able to uh, 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 explain just what the hell happened to oil prices this week. So to understand what happened, there are gonna be a few steps. I'm gonna do sort of an oversimplification right now, but forgive me, I'm gonna wear my economist professor hat and just kind of teach you a little bit about oil markets. So basically what happened is that a lot of retail investors started buying this one specific ETF. Uh, USO. USO is the United States Oil Fund. And you can see here, this is a chart that I took. Uh, this is from uh, uh, an app called Robinhood. Robinhood is uh, a, a free trading app in the US. So this is like an American uh, version of Quest Trade or Q Trade or, you know, Wealth Simple Invest, like where you can buy and sell your own investments. So a lot of traders use it in the US, but these are not sophisticated traders, these are retail traders, people doing it on their own. And they bought this specific ETF called uh, USO, the United States Oil Fund. You can see here, they really didn't, you know, this is the number of users holding it. And really no one owned it until, what, what's this, like March 9th? And then from March 9th until April, and then you can see it just jumped up to over 140 users buying this ETF. And I don't think they really knew what they were buying. And obviously these people lost a lot of money. You can see, it doesn't really matter when you bought it, right? But certainly at the end here, the price cratered. And the reason for that is people didn't know what they were buying. So I'm gonna show you what they were buying. Um, they're buying this United States oil fund. I kind of get a kick out of the USCF. This is the investment company that makes this ETF. And in fact, this is not actually an ETF. It's not an exchange traded fund. This is an ETP, an, an exchange, exchange traded, traded product, because it's not so much a fund the way a lot of the normal ETFs are. are. It's, it's kind of ironic to me that they say invest in what's real. real. And they're like, yeah, because they're all about commodities. When in fact, I don't think people realized how real of a thing they were buying. So what this, uh, uh, what this fund does is they invest in something called crude oil futures contracts. So the, a futures contract, it's really important to understand what this is, what this means. Um, a futures contract is a contract to buy, in this case, a barrel of oil on a specific date um, in the future. So you're not doing it right now, you're not buying a barrel of oil now, you're buying a barrel of oil in the future. And you can do it, they typically do it by month, okay? So you're gonna have, you know, over the next little while. Now, the problem is that people don't know, most people don't know what the heck an, a futures contract is. And what they didn't realize is that oil contracts, the way this uh, ETF works, and I'm just gonna call it an ETF for simplicity's sake, but the way it works is that they would own a huge amount of the next month's contract. So if we look at, this is gonna be the uh, NYMEX, which is the New York uh, Mercantile Exchange. This is where commodities are traded. And these are crude oil futures. So if I look at the quotes right now, you can see that we can see the futures market to buy a barrel of oil on June 1st or July 1st or August 1st. You can see the price has since sort of rebounded. It's not negative anymore. This was very much a blip in the market. But, you know, I could very easily have a contract and I could buy, you know, for $16.50, I could buy a barrel of oil on June 1st. Now you'll notice that today's date is uh, April 23rd, but we don't have May futures anymore. What I would have to do is I would have to go back in time. I believe it was here. Uh, uh, or no, sorry, settlements, my bad, um, is that, and I can go back a couple of days. And if I go back just a couple of days to April 21st, you can see here May 20 futures. So basically the way this works is that if you buy a futures contract in April, there's something called a settlement date. And on that settlement date, this is gonna be about a week before, like, you know, uh, 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 the end of the month. 
if you own the contract on that settlement date, you then physically have to take a barrel of oil uh, from a seller in, it's uh, Cushing, Oklahoma. It's like the end of the pipeline, and you are responsible for a physical barrel of oil. Well, what happened is on the 20th, all of these May 20 contracts owned by USO, this United States Oil Fund, were set to expire. Now, the US Oil Fund, they're not gonna take possession of the barrels of oil. They're not set up for that. They are a financial company, they wanna deal in these paper products. But they had to sell these contracts because they didn't wanna take control of them. And the algorithm said very clearly, on April 20th, we're gonna sell all of our May 2020 futures contracts and we're gonna roll them over into June. 20 contracts. Now, throughout history, throughout, you know, the, the last however many years and decades that there have been these future contracts, this has never been a problem. There's always been someone willing to buy those contracts from you. On April 20th of this year, nobody was willing to buy them. And there are a few reasons for this, the main one being that there's no more storage. There's no storage, there's no tanks, there's this glut of oil, there's all this oil, lots of supply, no demand. And so because this fund, US Oil Fund, had to sell these contracts and there were no buyers, the price went negative. And you can see that at the lowest point that people were paying people were paying $40.32 to sell these contracts, which meant that investors, other investors were able to buy oil and get paid, receive money by buying these contracts. You can see that on the 21st, it also was negative for part of the day but it actually did end up, this is the last price would be at the last day on the 20th, the market did regulate itself and it got back to positive, but for a very, very brief moment in time, the price of oil went negative. And this was a historic marker. Now, in the grand scheme of things, like so what? So what? Does this matter? Not really, it doesn't really matter. The price went negative, it was a blip, it was, it's gone back up, you know, if I look at it as of today, you know, you can see here that it, uh, the last price, here it is, about 17 bucks a barrel, you know, not the end of the world, not the implosion that we saw, but I think this had a huge profound impact on the psychology. That when people saw these headlines of oil going negative for the first time, I think that that was yet a further signal to investors that you need to be cautious with this oil market, that things are not working right, that this imbalance between supply and demand, there's way more supply than there is demand, that this was a giant, giant, giant red flag for investors in uh, the fossil fuel sector. Um, so really the lesson learned, what I want you to take away from this is don't invest in things you don't understand that really that's the lesson here, that if we look at USO, I'm gonna look at USO here and bring up the chart, right? And I'm just gonna show it to you over the last little bit. People didn't know what they were buying, right? And so if we look at it over the last year, right? The price here, about $12, $12, okay, whatever, you know, $12, and then now obviously the price of oil started to go down. It went down a lot. It looks like it was right around March end of March, beginning of April, this is when I think investors started to get a little optimistic. They were like, ooh, I'm gonna buy this fund, I'm gonna buy this, not knowing what it is, paid upwards of six bucks, and it, it then just absolutely collapsed. Where, you know, I think a lot of people, the psychology was like, well, the price of oil can't fall anymore. And it's like, well, they got proven wrong. That for the first time ever, the price of oil went negative. And I think for a large, the biggest factor in this was that a lot of these retail investors had no idea what they were doing. They bought this ETP exchange traded product thinking it was an ETF, thinking that it was like, okay, you know, it's just gonna track the price of oil, not realizing that they were actually buying these futures contracts and that they ended up losing a lot of money doing this. 
So that's what happened in the oil market today. It was fascinating for me to watch it, or I guess not today, this week. It was fascinating to watch it. It was really a historic moment. There are all these memes going around and, you know, really, uh, I think it is something that did break through. And I think it's a very, it's a moment in time that we're going to remember when oil prices went negative for the first time, because I do think they might go negative again. So any questions about that? I'm happy to move on. I've sort of got my divestment 101 uh, ready to go, but I do just want to take a little quick moment. If you have any questions about what I just wrote, I know it's a little bit of a weird, obscure lesson in future contracts and oil markets, but hopefully you found it as interesting as I did. Uh, hopefully you learned a little bit about why oil prices went negative. And if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat window. Um, I'll just give it a moment here. And then if there aren't any questions, I'll move on to the actual divestment side of things. All right, uh, I'm gonna assume that there's no questions here. If there are, if they do pop up, then that's fine. There's a little bit of a lag sometimes, um, but uh, uh, I'll assume there are no questions. So I'm gonna move on and start talking about divestment. So really what I've done here is come up with a bit of a divestment 101 lesson plan, um, tackle a few things, help you understand sort of both the financial rationale as well as sort of the moral imperative for why people might wanna divest. And then towards the end, I am going to get into some more practical examples of how you actually can divest from fossil fuels. Uh, so before I get into divestment, I really want to make clear. Oh, uh, I do see the question. What, what's the risk this might happen in, in June? It might happen. Honestly, I don't know. My hope is that people have smartened up. I really, really hope that, that, that people have kind of figured out. So it was kind of interesting. We can track the June prices very, very easily. Oops, where, where'd it go? So um, I can look at this and again, um, you know, what we can see is look at the price for the June contracts. So I'm gonna look at this last, that you know, it was still trading at 21 bucks a barrel. And then on the 21st, it went down to 13 bucks a barrel. And then on the 22nd, it was back up to 21 bucks a barrel. And then today the preliminary is at about 22 bucks a barrel. So, you know, my hope is that the, uh, 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 the, the investors in USO now actually know what the heck they're buying. And so this won't happen again. But, you know, one thing that would be really interesting, I don't know if I'd be able to get this uh, on the history, but looking at how much is actually invested in this fund, you can see about $3 billion invested in this, which is just ludicrous. Like, look at how much money these people have lost. And there's like $3 billion invested in this fund. And um, uh, uh, I'd be really curious to track this number over the last few days. My hope is that there would be less money in this than there was before. Um, also, I think that the ETF itself has wisened up a bit that when we were looking at it before, they really had all these different, that most of the money was in the next month. And you can see here now, actually most of it is actually, you know, it's not in June. Here's this plus this. So maybe about 820,000 or 820 million rather is invested there, but the majority is July, 2020 and then August 2020. So basically, I think that the fund has wisened up. I think that investors have wisened up. I think it's very, very unlikely that this does happen in again in June. Although what I will say is that basically like oil storage, you know, is filling up. And if it gets full, you know, before production gets cut, then, you know, really who knows what the heck is going to happen. So, you know, I would be cautious with this. And again, I really don't want uh, people to think that, oh, you know, it can't go any lower. Now's a good time to invest. No, it can definitely go lower. If we get all the storage absolutely full and the oil keeps flowing, then we're going to be right back in this scenario uh, next month. Um, Simon asks here, uh, do I know of any major investors who've now taken the leap and invested in sustainable alternatives? So, I mean, organizations have been doing this. I will just say right now, I'll give a little shout out to Guelph. I think University did divest, I think. Uh, so yeah, here it is. This just came up. So the University of Guelph today voted to divest from fossil fuels. 
Um, this might have been, this was yesterday. It looks like it was a little Earth Day decision. Good for the University of Guelph. But yeah, they're, they might have been a little bit too late. Like really, I, you know, I bet they're really wishing that they had made this decision three months ago before fossil fuels absolutely cratered. So it will be interesting to see any of these uh, universities and organizations where we've been pushing for this, uh, uh, for divestment, you know, we're now going to be able to go and actually calculate how much money they've lost from this. Um, is there a pure renewables ETF in Canadian dollars? No, I'm going to, Onana, I'll, I'll address that a little bit later. I'm going to talk a little bit about green stuff. Uh, short answer is there's not an ETF. There are mutual funds that I can show you. But uh, if I don't get to this, just remind me a little bit later. I do want to stay focused on the topic of divestment. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is now what I want to do is explain this difference between ESG and divestment. These are two different things. So what I want to do is start by showing you ESG data. Um, I've got the slide here, but let's do it in real time. We can have fun with this. So when it comes to ESG data, there are two main sources. Uh, I'm just going to show you Apple score just because they're like the largest. Here, I can make it a little bigger. Um, notice that on Yahoo Finance, there is this sustainability tab over here. So when it comes to this, uh, you know, you can see here that uh, for Apple, uh, they're in the 32nd percentile, a lower score is better, very low environment score, decent social score, that's not too high, here I'll make it a little bigger, and governance score, you know, not awful, not great. Uh, I know there's no real relative context for these, so this is just, I'm, I know from looking at other uh, uh, companies. And then what's kind of cool is that you can also see these product involvement areas. So this is more for people who do want to like divest from specific issues. You can see if they do have involvement in all these areas. But otherwise you can see really we do get this environment, social and governance score. Uh, you know, the other big site for this is going to be MSCI. So MSCI, Morgan Stanley Capital Indexes, uh, they also do these ESG ratings. You can see here Apple right uh they're gonna have a decent score single a the top rating would be triple a then double a then single a so they're not bad among tech companies um you know there's actually no triple a here among technology hardware storage and peripherals so you know an a is not bad kind of puts them in the top you know probably 25 percent at least uh, and then you can see here they do, oh, this is a little awkward. I'll make this bigger just for a moment. You can see they do show where the company's a laggard or average or leader. So that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, really what I want to communicate when it comes to this ESG is that it's not going to account for fossil fuels, that often they don't look at what the company is actually selling. So this is why a company like Suncor can actually have a decent ESG score. Obviously, very high environmental risk, no surprise there, but the social risk and the governance risk is quite low for Suncor. When I look them up on uh, MSCI, you're going to see here, you know, SU, that, um, you know, again, they get an A rating, that a lot of this is done according to their industry, that these ESG ratings, it's not so much about what they're selling. Um, instead, it's about things like their policies, and their procedures, and the uh, really the, the the goals they've set, and and their targets, and are they on track to meet those targets? So this is why I like to make the distinction between ESG investing versus divestment. They often sort of get convoluted. Ideally, in a perfect world, we would do both, but I do want to just kind of you know make that very very clear distinction. Um, so I showed you MSCI. You know, and when it comes to ESG, I would say ESG is sort of pulled ahead of divestment right now in terms of priorities. Uh, that what we're seeing is, you know, investors are really starting to catch on. I have a whole bit that I did in a presentation earlier about how, you know, people used to call me a hippie for talking about sustainability and sustainable investing and all this stuff. And they would just dismiss me. So I have this little joke like, you know, here are the big hippies at Harvard Business Review. You know, mounting evidence shows that sustainable companies deliver significant positive financial performance and investors are beginning to value them more highly. In uh, investment lingo, we talk about a preference. So we're starting to see a preference for these ESG uh, uh, companies or companies with high ESG scores. Here are these giant hippies, these massive tree huggers at RBC Global Asset Management. 
you know, companies that score highly in terms of their approach to ESG factors tend to deliver higher cash returns on their investments than their sector peers. Like, wow, this is RBC Global Asset Management saying, you know, higher cash returns for companies that are ESG leaders. Uh, here's MSCI, Morgan Stanley Capital Indices. They've done so much research around this and they do a lot of the studies and the more sort of research. And we found that over the last five years, companies with higher ESG ratings exhibited higher average return on invested capital compared to companies with lower ESG ratings, right? And then of course, you know, uh, BlackRock. BlackRock owns iShares, which is, you know, uh, probably they are the largest asset manager in the world. A lot of very popular ETFs come from BlackRock. And what they're talking about is that ESG investing is not just about doing good. A growing body of research points to a link with asset performance. Companies that manage sustainability risks and opportunities well tend to have stronger cash flows, lower borrowing costs, and higher valuations. Like this to me is just like, you know, yeah, this is what we're talking about. That really there is a financial rationale for wanting to invest in companies that have these better ESG scores. And a lot of evidence is pointing to the fact that they are more profitable. Um, this is no surprise to me. Uh, this is what I've been studying for a while. Uh, over a decade ago, uh, uh, you know, uh, I read this book by Bob Willard. Bob Willard is from Whitby, Ontario. So he's a local guy. He's brilliant. I would say, you know, one of the absolute leaders. He literally wrote the book on the business case for sustainability. And, you know, what he talks about is it's a very simple uh, uh, philosophy that companies that are leaders in sustainability are more efficient, right? They use less energy and less water and fewer materials, meaning their costs are lower. Their employees are more productive because the people that work for these companies actually give a damn about the company they're working for. Right, and because they're treated well, they work harder and they're more loyal. They stay with the company longer because the cost associated with hiring and training new employees is so high that if you can have employees that are more loyal, that stick around a lot longer, then you know, you're gonna save a bunch of money there. And uh, finally, they are more innovative. That basically they're the ones coming out with the, the doing the R&D, coming out with products and services that are going to appeal to this next generation of consumers that are fair trade, that are organic, that are ethically sourced, that are uh, low carbon, that are higher efficiency. They're the ones sort of pushing the boundary on there and creating these new lineups of products that are increasingly becoming uh, 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 more profitable and more popular. Uh, there was a really recent study that just came out in the last week from the RIA, the Responsible Investment Association. Uh, so this is an organization for responsible investments here in Canada. Uh, what they did is they looked at these, this, the average responsible investment fund versus the average asset class fund performance. So the blue line is the average performance of a responsible global equity fund versus the, the yellow bar is the average global equity fund, the sort of like non-responsible one. And you can see here that whether we're looking at the last three months, which would be the crash, or the last year, or the last three years, or the last five years, that these responsible investment funds have performed better. Now, I wanna be clear, past performance is not indicative of future results. I can't promise you that responsible investments or ESG investing is necessarily going to uh, uh, generate uh, uh, higher profits and higher returns for investors. I don't have the crystal ball. What I can tell you is that if we look at this over the last five years, it certainly has done that. And I don't personally see any reason why it wouldn't continue. I think that investors that were just getting started in terms of this preference, and I do think that we are going to be seeing a big policy shift coming out of this pandemic, that I think governments are going to put a higher premium on uh, uh, human issues. Uh, like healthcare and education, on social issues, um, and on environmental issues. I would love to see a Green New Deal. Um, you know, I really would love to see stimulus spending that prioritizes people and the planet. I don't know if it's going to happen, but I think there's a high likelihood. Uh, I've got my hopes up a little bit. And certainly in that case, things would continue to outperform in that scenario. So before I shift to divestment, I do see a little question here. 
uh, uh, given the example with oil, could the same be said for creating the same issue with other financial products that retail investors do not understand? Or is this more specific to commodity-based products? Okay, so this is a great question. Um, and absolutely, I see all these little blips when it comes to people investing in things they don't understand. There are all kinds of these really weird niche ETFs, leveraged ETFs that you borrow money to invest, right? So you buy a share, but they're borrowing money, so it's leveraged. These things called inverse ETFs, where you're actually betting that the market goes down. So if the market goes up, this ETF is an inverse ETF, it'll go down. But if the market goes down, the inverse ETF will go up. There are a lot of these investment products specifically around ETFs that people don't understand. And I think we are going to see these blips. Now, when it comes to this specific issue around prices going negative, and that is very much to do with uh, 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 commodities. And oil specifically is a tricky commodity because it does need to be stored very carefully. And there are a lot of regulations around that. Other commodities, it might not be as bad that, you know, you might be able to buy them and store them more easily. Whereas oil, you know, is a little bit unique there. Um, so, you know, but what I would say is that I think there are a lot of these like financial innovations and these like really bizarre niche investment products that I don't want to go anywhere near them. Again, my mantra is like, don't invest in things you don't understand. Right, And you don't need to understand all the ins and outs or all the companies inside the ETF, but make sure that you do actually understand the structure. And especially when it comes to commodities, when it comes to some of these weird, you know, inverse things or leverage or these, you know, active or these, there are all these really weird ETFs right now that um, I think are going to be, uh, 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 you know, even more prevalent in the future that um and and i am worried that retail investors are just gonna get duped are gonna buy something because their buddy told them to buy it and their buddy made a whole bunch of money this whole idea of the hot tip fallacy i'm sure that's what happened with oil right that when i look at the chart of the users buying it i have no doubt that this jump up here that there would have been a reddit post you know there's this whole wall street bets uh subreddit where people just do the most ridiculous things there are all these little chat forums and, you know, Discord and, you know, where people talk about this stuff. And when I see action like this, where, you know, the number of people who bought it doubled in such a short period of time, I have no doubt that people bought it just on a whim. So I would be very, very cautious and I would not want to invest in something if I didn't understand how the heck it worked. Uh, okay, Simon here, what do I think might be the quick win aspects of a Green New Deal? Uh, I can get into green stuff a little bit later. I'm going to talk about that. I want to keep things focused on the divestment right now. Um, but, you know, short answer of this is that I don't know. I'm going to need to look at that. At this point, I'm kind of focused on looking at companies uh, that are going to be okay during a prolonged uh, 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 pandemic. If we do start to see us coming out of it and restrictions lesson and start opening up the economy and if we start to feel about things about a green new deal i might start looking at things then but i do feel like it's a little bit early to talk about uh, uh the green new deal and what would benefit there so uh okay so we talked about responsible investment why you want to do that now i want to talk to you about divestment and i want to talk to you about the carbon bubble so uh you know when it comes to carbon um, you know, this is a chart, this is from uh, probably about a year and a half ago by a group called the Carbon Tracker Initiative. What they did is they looked at the value of all the different carbon reserves. Now, I did a little bit digging into this, and this 27 trillion figure, it's a little misleading because a big chunk of this is going to be fossil fuels that are underground, but also even an even bigger chunk of this is real estate that it is either wide, you know, hugely energy inefficient, or it's also going to be uh, 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 um, in places, for example, floodplains, that as climate change gets worse, this real estate could be at risk. 
So when it comes to this uh, 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 carbon, proven carbon reserves, I want to be clear, there are other metrics uh, and people who have tried to estimate this. This is like the largest number I could come up with. This was supposed to be my like scare you into divestment slide. Because what it says is that if we look at all the proven carbon reserves that are at risk, it equals about $27 trillion. But if we look at the burnable carbon, which is the amount of carbon that we can safely burn in a one and a half degree Paris Accord climate scenario, it's only worth about $7 trillion. Meaning that there's about $20 trillion of capital at risk. That if we were to take climate change seriously, and actually shift our economy in accordance with the climate, the Paris Accord, that potentially we could see these write downs of $20 trillion. Now, this bubble has already started to massively deflate. That what we've seen over the last three months is just huge, huge, huge write offs and devaluation of these carbon reserves. Just to give you a quick little summary of that, so I know, for example, tech resources uh, right down. So they had a big project right down. So you can see here, this is an oil sands mine and they just took a $312 million loss on the write down, um, right? So a lot of these projects that were viewed as assets, we're now starting to realize these aren't gonna get developed. These are not assets. These are worth essentially nothing. So we're going to start to see a lot more of these. We already have, um, but we're going to be seeing a lot more of this. So it's hard to know what this number is, but really this is my like worst case scenario of what it could be that there is this bubble that at one point was $20 trillion, probably a lot less now, but still probably very, very big. To put this in context, in 2007, the value of the U.S. home equity market was $13 trillion. And then in 2009, that same market was worth $6 trillion. So this was a $7 trillion housing bubble that obviously was the first domino that caused a global recession. We're looking at a market that potentially is three times larger than that. So I am really still worried about this. I do think that there's a lot, a lot, a lot of value here that could be in trouble um, and is gonna get written off if we do agree to take climate change more seriously. And again, this is like, oh, Tim, you know, you're overreacting. You're, you know, you're such a hippie environmentalist. Well, here are the other, you know, sort of uh, uh, eco-fascists or whatever other slurs people have thrown out at me. Uh, here's the Bank of Canada. And this is what the Bank of Canada is saying. Uh, what they said in their latest update, and now this was pre-COVID, so it'll be interesting to see their messaging around this as we do get through this crisis. But what they said is that climate change continues to pose risks to both the economy and the financial system. These include physical risks from disruptive weather events and transition risks from adapting to a lower carbon global economy. If some fossil fuel reserves remain unexploited, meaning if we keep them in the ground, assets in this sector may become stranded, losing much of their value. At the same time, other sectors such as green technology and alternative energy will likely benefit. So this is like the Bank of Canada saying exactly my point, that there are all of these assets that if we acknowledge climate change is real and take action to, to have a low carbon economy, those assets become stranded, they get written off the balance sheets, right? And they're gonna lose much of their value. So this is really the financial imperative from uh, for divestment, that we are saying that right now, at this moment in time, these fossil fuel assets are mispriced. They are priced too high. That we're gonna see these prices come down, we're gonna see projects get canceled, we're gonna see those assets written off, right? And that that's gonna cause further loss to investments in the sector. This is really the biggest financial imperative. Now, so what? Does it matter? How does my little RST or TFSA matter? This is something the Bank of Canada should be handling, right? Well, what we're seeing is that the impact of more and more uh, uh, of an investment preference towards e both ESG 
and fossil fuel divestment, that this has a direct impact on the company's cost of capital. So this is the cost, the com companies, they need to raise capital. And they raise it in two ways. They raise it through equity by issuing more shares, and they raise money through debt by issuing bonds. And what we see here is that companies with a low ESG score have a higher cost of capital than companies with a higher ESG score. And we are definitely seeing this in the fossil fuel uh, sector. Um, oh, speakers are starting to echo. Sorry, that might be on your end, uh, Jamil. I can't help you on that. Um, you might want to play with your, your speakers a little bit, maybe throw in some headphones. If other people have echo, let me know. Please let me know, and I can try to fix it. But otherwise, it might just be on your end there. So when it comes to this cost of capital, this is a hugely important metric because this is the rate at which companies are able to raise money for their projects. When that capital is more expensive, it means that it's, there, there are going to be fewer and fewer projects that are actually uh, uh, profitable. So my little like change here, the change theory around divestment is a bit of a reinforcing loop that it starts with people and organizations to divest. Okay, uh, if we're hearing a little bit, oh no, I think it's on my end. Uh, hold on. Oh, other people are having echo. Uh, give me one moment here. Let me just see, maybe I'm just yelling too loud. It comes and goes as I move around. What if, if I hold up like this, uh, does this work a little bit better? Let's just give the leg. Oh, sorry about the getting an echo here too. Okay. Um, let me see if the, the stream catches up and see if I hold it closer. Does this work? Let's just see. I really hate this leg. It drives me nuts. Um, it might have just been me moving around. I'm hoping that holding the microphone up here works. Uh, let me keep moving forward. If you can give me feedback, if it does still uh, echo, then that's fine. Um, what I'll do is I'll try putting the microphone a little bit further away. But for now, uh, what I'm gonna do is lower my voice, but hold the microphone a little closer. Um, so basically the change theory is that people and organizations have best, right? You're going to divest. Oh, no change. So, but it's totally, okay. Uh, okay, if it doesn't matter, I think you might just have to deal with it and maybe we'll sort that out a little bit later. So apologies for the echo. I'll do the best I can. So um, really the change theory is that people divest, organizations divest. This causes lower demand for these stocks. From there, the lower demand for those stocks, that's what's causing the higher cost of capital because there aren't as many investors willing to buy the shares and there aren't as many investors willing to uh, uh, do it. I don't have headphones. I can't be do that. I do not have speakers on. What is, oh shoot, worse now. Okay, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, let me just adjust one setting. It's audible. Yeah, I don't want it to be audible. I want it to be good. Uh, okay, um, let me just see if there's anything I can do. Okay, now better but not perfect. So maybe if I do a little bit further away, let me roll with this. And unfortunately, uh, I can't do headphones. I can't do anything like that. I think I'm going to have to just uh, throw it in there. Uh, so, okay, so basically as people divest and organizations divest, lower demand for the shares and for the bonds results in a higher cost of capital right this means that these companies become less profitable certainly their long-term investments are less profitable because they have to borrow or raise money at a higher rate because the companies are less profitable what it means is that people more people are going to divest right that really this is the change theory here that as more and more people sell lower demand higher cost of capital, less profitable, more people are gonna divest. This is what I think is happening right now. And I wanna say that we've now verified that, yeah, a lot of people are divesting organizations, a lot of them are, result, and that we're seeing this loop happen in real time. And I only expect this to accelerate and accelerate and accelerate. 
So really to me, this is the financial imperative, right? And that I always get this question, you know, can't get any lower, right? Tim, you know, now's the time to buy fossil fuels, right? It can't get any lower. Well, except that's what people said a little while ago. So let me go. I'm going to show you XEG. So this is the iShares S&P TSX capped energy index. This is the Canadian energy index. Uh, from there, what we're going to do is look at the five-year chart here. And you can see that over the last five, now if I do max, this will show you, you know, that this was 14, 2014, and then the share price came down quite a bit in 2015. This was sort of that oil. And then I heard the refrain here, you know, can't get any lower than this. And then now all of a sudden we're at a point where even from, this was December 1st, 2019, and it has gotten cut in half again. Now, what I think is likely going to happen to the energy sector is that we're going to start seeing dividend cuts. You know, for example, if we see Suncor, right? Now, with Suncor, they have a really nice dividend right now, 8.44%. I don't know if that's going to be sustainable. I don't know if they're going to keep being able to do that, right? If I'm them if, and I'm running short on cash, the first thing I do is cut the dividend. Now, Suncor might be in a better position because they do have a lot of refining capacity. And so refiners are actually benefiting from these low oil prices. Here's Synovus. This is a company that is a little bit more of an extraction company. You can see oof, down from like 13 bucks down to $3 and then it has bounced back up just a little bit. But again, you know, what they're saying here is, you know, the yield not available will be interesting to see how they react to it. But I really do think that in the energy sector in North America, we are going to see dividend cuts, number one, and we're going to see bankruptcies, number two. Now, I see the question over here, you know, but then you have governments bailing them out and maybe, except I don't think so. I think that certainly here in Canada, a strong signal was sent that any bailout is going to be tied to environmental measures. Now, the U.S. could be a different story. The U.S., in the U.S., I really think, you know, with Trump right now, and I think they likely are going to bail out some of the U.S. oil companies. But here in Canada, I think that is a tough sell politically. Obviously, we as, as advocates do need to keep pressure on the government to not bail them out. Um, and then I really want to underscore just when it comes to climate change, just how important the U.S. election is going to be. That really, you know, I'm not a huge fan of Joe Biden, but I'm very, very certain that he's going to have a better view and a better stance on climate change than Donald Trump is. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens in terms of governments. You know, there might be ballots. We'll see what happens. But honestly, this view, this perspective of it can't get any lower just want to remind you that yes, it can. And that certainly the best time to divest would have been, you know, five, six years ago before the first oil crash, when oil was still at a hundred bucks a barrel. The second best time to divest would have been about three months ago, you know, before the next oil crash happened. But I want to be clear that I think that energy sector is going to be in for a rough, rough ride for the next little while. It could bounce back. If we do get a bounce back, then, you know, in the short term, it could bounce back up. But, you know, I would say that really, I would just be really cautious of this sentiment that it can't get any lower because it can always get lower. From there, this is, I've been talking a lot about the financial imperative. Uh, I do want to talk for a moment about the ethical imperative for why uh, someone probably wants to divest from fossil fuels. Uh, you know, if you're on this webinar, you probably care about your own personal carbon footprint. And so, you know, really, again, I want to be clear, I want people to fly less isn't this kind of a funny thought right now, that of course everybody is flying less right now. Um, you know, certainly if you can afford an electric car or if you can ride your bike a lot more, fantastic. Um, yes, 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 eat less meat, absolutely. I want you to do all those things. But if you're doing all of those things, and you haven't divested from fossil fuels, there is a good chance that your portfolio, if it's greater than 100K, actually has a higher carbon footprint 
than all those three things combined. The, the carbon footprint of our investments is huge. And if you've got a 500K portfolio, look at how big. This is your annual carbon footprint. If you've got a million dollars. million dollars is not that big. If you're planning to retire, if you're close to retirement, you need more than a million dollars, right? The carbon footprint of the annual carbon footprint of your portfolio is massive. Now, they do make some assumptions here. One of the assumptions here is 100% equity, so 100% stocks. They don't look at bonds here at all. And they also do assume 50-50 between Canadian equities and global equities. And the reason that's important is that Canadian equities have a very, very high carbon footprint. So to get the carbon footprint of an ETF, we can get it from Morningstar. You can see here, I've looked up the iShares Core S&P TSX Capped Composite Index ETF. This is uh, XIC, very, very popular Canadian equity ETF. And here I can go down to the carbon metrics. So cool that I can get this for all the different ETFs now. And you can see that the fossil fuel involvement is really high. If you just invest in this very standard uh, Canadian equity ETF, 30% of your money is invested in fossil fuels. And you've got a carbon risk score here of 15 that I can tell you is very, very high. For example, I can compare this uh, to SPY, which is the S&P 500, which would be a U.S. equity ETF, very, very standard uh, U.S. equity ETF. And so when it comes to the U.S. markets, the carbon footprint is going to be way lower, much lower fossil fuel involvement, much lower carbon risk score, that I do want to be clear that the reason why these numbers are so high is because Canadians, by default, if you haven't explicitly tried to lower your carbon footprint or if you haven't divested from fossil fuels, that this, your portfolio is gonna have huge exposure. And this Morningstar tool can be really cool because we, when we start to look at funds, and I'm gonna now start talking about specific funds, but you know we can just see how uh, low carbon different funds are. So I know there is the uh, uh, MD fossil fuel free ET, uh, 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 um, mutual fund. So it was interesting. I had a little bit of involvement with this. I spoke to MD management while they were developing this. I kind of pushed them to go a little bit further. I was a little bit disappointed with how far they went on it. And I can see here that although it is very close to fossil fuel involvement, there is a little bit of fossil fuels in here. So, and these would be natural gas utilities. So really, you know, this is a cool tool. You can see that in this case, you know, the MD fossil fuel free one, it's gonna be very, very close. If we did this compared to an MD global equity, just a regular one. Oh, is it not gonna be, hold on. I just wanna see if they do have an MD. Here we do, we can do uh, MD equity, which would just be like their standard one right we can see here that it's likely going to have a much much higher carbon footprint look at this so really you know it's kind of cool using this morningstar tool yahoo finance is great for individual companies uh, uh morningstar is going to be great when it comes to these etfs uh okay i just want to see a couple questions here uh which companies are involved in the cleaning up of the oil sands can I use my investments to encourage this investment in Alberta as opposed to the oil sector? Good question, Gail. Uh, I don't have a great answer for you there. I don't know how involved they are in Alberta. Uh, there is a cool ETF, uh, which is EVX, which is Environmental Services. Um, and I, this is these are American companies, but they probably have contracts with a lot of the American companies. And these are gonna be companies involved in uh, waste collection, transfer disposal services, recycling services, soil remediation, wastewater management, and environmental consulting services. So if we look at the holdings here, this could be an interesting list. I don't know which one's at the top of my head, but it wouldn't surprise me if some of these companies were involved in the cleanup in Alberta. Uh, I haven't seen any publicly traded companies, although maybe I'll start keeping my eye, eye out. And I do feel like there was an, an, another question here. Yeah, uh, Onana here, sorry, off topic. Uh, computers doing the trading. 
do, do I think the volumes when they spike so high? So it's hard to know with the computer, but this is a bit of a tangent. So I'll just address it very briefly. But you know, what I will say is with a lot of these ETFs and specifically with the USO, you know, it is the algorithm that decides when they were going to sell the June futures and shift to July futures, or I guess May futures and shift to June or July. So what I would say is, you know, uh, it's going to depend on the ETF there. Um, I don't want to get too much into the high frequency trading. Echo is better now. I'm so happy about that. Uh, okay, great. So let me get back to my presentation. So again, you know, this is why from an ethical perspective, you probably want to look at divestment, that if you're looking for ways to uh, uh, lower your own personal footprint, carbon footprint, then you need to look at your investments. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes now just talking about some of my model portfolios just to give you uh, some resources that if you do want to divest, how you can do it. Um, hopefully, a lot of people here do know about the traditional uh, Canadian couch potato. So this would be a very standard investment approach. You can see here, you know, uh, Canadian bonds, you know, Canadian stocks, U.S. stocks and international stocks. So this would be a very standard approach. But of course, you know, you're going to own things like Exxon and Philip Morris and Lockheed Martin, TransCanada. The carbon footprint is going to be really high, especially for that Canadian equity side. Uh, that's why I've developed some different model portfolios. So if you care more about the ESG side, you know, we could do this sort of organic couch potato. Let me just bring it up on my blog. Um, so uh, uh, here we go. And let me just bring up my model portfolios. So the organic couch potato, this is going to be slightly lower carbon. It's not fossil fuel free, but you can see here I've gone and done like Canadian equity, US equity, international equity, have done a little bit of green equity. So this would be more investing in the solutions and then, you know, looking at government bonds. So this would be like a step in the right direction. This was like the first model portfolio I came up with. Uh, from there, uh, uh, really for people that wanted to go very specifically fossil fuel free, this is like before there were fossil fuel free ETFs. I came up with this really innovative way to completely divest, which is instead of doing it by geography, Canada, US, the rest of the world, instead of that, we're doing it global sector by sector. So global real estate, global healthcare, global industrials, global water, global consumer discretionary. And what I did here is I very strategically removed energy, oil and gas and pipelines. I also removed materials, which are mining companies. I also removed utilities, which a lot of the utilities burn coal. From there, we had the rest of the economy, so all the other global sectors. So this was like the first way I came up with it. But fortunately for you, or I guess I should say for us, because I want to divest as well, uh, there are some fossil fuel free portfolios now. So uh, easy as pie, this one has the uh, Desjardins RI Global Multi-Factor Fossil Fuel Reserves Free ETF. So this is a pretty cool one, uh, really does get rid of most fossil fuels. There are a couple utilities in here that do burn natural gas. So it's not like exactly like absolute zero, but it is pretty darn close. Uh, there is that MD Management Fossil Fuel Equity Fund, although, you know, it is on the more expensive side because it's a mutual fund. So I do prefer the ETFs. Uh, as well, there is the uh, uh, Squeaky Clean Portfolio. So if you, you're adamant about like absolutely no fossil fuels whatsoever, uh, you can look at this Horizons Global Sustainability Leaders ETF. Uh, it's not perfect. I talk a little bit about it here and that it does have a glaring weakness in its lack of diversification. Uh, this is one of the big trade-offs that when we do uh, divest from fossil fuels and the more things you want to divest from, you know, obviously what you're doing is you're investing in fewer and fewer companies. So really for me here, you know, this is going to be a good way to get sort of broad global equity exposure, but there are some gaps in it, which I do address uh, uh, about, uh, uh, um, you know, in, in the blog post here. Uh, I see a question here, thoughts about NEI. So NEI, I don't love. Uh, there are a couple different reasons for them. Let me just bring them up because NEI tends certainly from a fossil fuel perspective has not uh, um, uh, completely divested. 
and they focus a lot more on shareholder engagement. So their approach is that they are going to own the funds uh, or sort of own the companies and then push the companies in a more sustainable direction. So for example, if I look at this, uh, uh, you know, where's a global one? Here it is, global equity fund. So, you know, I can do this one and let me just show you in Morningstar uh, here it is, Global Equity Fund, and I'm doing the F series. So this would be the cheaper version. A tricky thing with mutual funds is the fees. So this F, if you buy it on your own, it's only 1.38%. But if I do NEI Global Equity, and if we do the A series, oops, um, the A series, it's the same exact fund, but you can see the fee is going to be a lot higher. 2.46. So if you're going to do mutual funds, buy the F series. They're way, way, way cheaper. Uh, from there, um, you know, let me just show you the portfolio and what's inside. And that what we can do is uh, look at the carbon footprint here. And you can see that actually the fossil fuel involvement for NEI funds is quite high. Uh, the one exception, the one ETF that I do like is this Environmental Leaders Fund. But this is what I would classify as like a doing more good fund that this is gonna be investing in green technologies. Um, so this is gonna be an environmental leaders, which is awesome. It means no fossil fuels. It means you know doing some really investing in more good. But to be clear, the approach that, you know, and look at this high fee. I won't get stuck on the fees, but hold on. I'm just curious, they've got it here. Is it gonna give me the carbon? Oh, look at this. And you know, fossil fuel involvement zero, which is great. Um, you know, so I do like the Environmental Leaders Fund, but to be clear, you know, with all of these, I tend to break it up between what I call doing less evil versus doing more good. So the Environmental Leaders Fund would be really, really good for this green section of the pie. But in terms of a global equity fund, where we do want exposure to Canadian, US, and global stocks, you know, it's not going to fit that part of the pie. So, like I said, there are some good Canadian mutual funds here for the doing more good. NEI's environmental leaders, I really like that one. The rest of them, when you look at what's inside, if you open them up, you know, certainly they're not going to be good from a, a divestment perspective. And even on the ESG side, they're a little bit weaker because they focus more on shareholder engagement. So the strategy there is own all the companies, even some of the nasty ones, and then push them towards sustainability. Personally, I'm not a huge fan of that approach. I would much rather just not own those companies in order to get that sort of systems change model that I was talking about. Um, the last thing I do want to bring up as we're looking at these is really, really exciting to me is that RBC iShares, uh, they have now come out with their new ETFs. So uh, uh, these I've been waiting for a little bit but they just expanded their ESG lineup. And I wanna show you, I think they're here, do they? Oh, no, these are the, here we go. These are the ESG advanced ETFs. Uh, from there, you can see here, they've got MSCI Canada, US EAFE. I'm gonna be digging more into these. I won't get the data from Morningstar yet because they are so brand new. These are a week old, but these are fossil fuel free. So I'll just give you a quick little look inside of them. But you can see this is, to my knowledge, the first Canadian equity ETF with no energy at all in here, which is awesome. If we look at what's in here, you can see, wow, Shopify number one, fascinating. And then Royal Bank, TD, CNR, Bank of Nova Scotia, no Suncor, no pipelines. To me, this is really cool. It is gonna have mining companies in here, right? So again, it won't be squeaky clean, but I would say we can take a look at these. With the USA one, again, there's gonna be no Exxon Mobil. It's interesting to me, no uh, Amazon, that they got screened out for their ESG score. So I'm gonna be digging more into these. Uh, so you can expect probably a blog post or something like that in the future uh, as they get a little more information, but really, really excited to see these new fossil fuel free ETFs from uh, iShares. Uh, I will address this question. Are there any ETFs like Vigro in terms of the all-in-one fund? 
Um, so, you know, what I will point out there, the only one we have is from BMO. Now, it's not fossil fuel free. It's an ESG one. So BMO, we do have this, what is it, ZESG, I believe, where this is the BMO Balanced ESG ETF. Inside of this, you're going to get the MSCI ESG leaders, USA, uh, Canada, EAFE, which is Europe, Australia, Far East. You're also going to get government bonds and some corporate bonds here, but these are all their ESG funds. Uh, to give you an example of it's not fossil fuel free, so if we look up this ESGA fund, ESGA, I'll show you here, uh, it is going to have fossil fuels inside. So you can see here Enbridge, huge holding, Suncor, huge holding, right? Um, so, you know, that's going to be your, the only all-in-one sustainable thing. Uh, my hope is that RBC iShares, that they're going to do the same with these ones. I would love to see an advanced product, uh, you know, that does have the Canada plus US plus EAFE all-in-one. I'm hoping, but uh, I haven't seen anything just yet to suggest that. Uh, looks like I missed a question here. Had a question emailed in, can I comment on the fossil fuel exposure of who? The Ontario Healthcare Pension Plan. Ugh. So not off the top of my head. I can't comment on the who pension plan. I would need to do some digging on that one. But what I can point you towards is shiftaction.ca. So this is, if you want to push your pension plan in a more sustainable direction. Yes, this is again, you know, another tool in your tool belt to be able to manage, uh, uh, to be able to take change. Uh, I want you to get involved with uh, shift action. And it wouldn't surprise me if they are doing, are looking at who. So this is, all, they're about pushing pensions to be able to uh, protect pension wealth and pension health. Uh, let me just see if Hoop was in their latest uh, uh, report, because it might be. I just want to see here if they did it. Uh, let me see here. These are the risks. I feel like they did do this progress. Yeah, here we go. They did do Hoop. Look at this. So according to this, um, Hoop is at the starting line. That This is not a good sign. So this is going to be from, you know, uh, 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 you know, really understanding that they are just at the starting line. Um, you can see these are the pension plans that are getting started. And then the ones that are rising to the challenge, like OP Trust and Ontario Teachers Pension Plan and Case de Depot et Placement du Québec, CDPQ, would be right now be sort of the, the pension plan the most further ahead. So it looks like Hoop does have some work to do. I'm just curious if we do get any information. I think they'll be down here at the starting line. Here it is, Hoop. So its later, latest responsible investing policy does not include uh, any mention of climate change, is not signed to the, this would be the task force for climate related financial disclosures, right? So this would be about disclosures here. Uh, it has undertaken a climate change risk and resilience assessment on its real estate assets, uh, but it did not respond to a letter from beneficiaries requesting information. So to me, this is a huge red flag that if you're looking at Hoop, if you're a member of Hoop, uh, this is a problem. Uh, this is really, really, really big problem. Uh, we can see here shift action is pushing Hoop. So, you know, what I would suggest is I would get involved. Uh, I would sign up and sort of take action with Hoop um, and that what that would do is, you know, add your voice to this organization, which is pushing pension plans to be able to take further steps in this direction. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, BMO, ESGG. Yeah, so that's going to be a similar all-in-one. It doesn't have the bonds. So with ESGG, I'll just show this one quickly. So this is going to be an all-in-one 100% equity. So I really like it. If you're looking for an all-in-one global equity, I'm into this. I like it. It does have a very low percentage for Canada, so it doesn't have a Canadian bias, which I'm kind of, I like this. Um, the big gap here is no emerging markets. So it's Canada, USA, and EAFE, which is Europe, Australia, Far East. So a little bit of a gap there. 
Uh, but to me, if, if the goal is 100% equity or if you want to like buy this with a bond ETF, no problem. Again, it's not going to be fossil fuel free, but it is ESG leaders. So I like it from that perspective. But if you're trying to divest, unfortunately, it won't fit the bill. Uh, and then there was another question about from Ronald. Can I comment on REITs? Uh, how do these rate regarding ESG? So I haven't seen a specific uh, ESG REIT ETF. I would love it if there was one. I'm curious, you know, if there is one. I wonder, you know, this wouldn't surprise me. Uh, this will be interesting. No, I've looked at this. It doesn't. But really, I don't think there is anything specific. Oh, it looks like there might be this hip uh but this would be us so i think this is a us mutual fund this like hip investor uh yeah so my guess i want to do a little bit of a a little more research into this um but could be interesting but my guess is that this is a mutual fund not an etf so Canadian investors wouldn't be able to buy this. So um, Ronald would love to get deeper into this at a different time. I think the real estate sector is fantastic to from, you know, very fascinating from an ESG perspective. So maybe I can get into that later, but probably not right now. Uh, from here, uh, you know, don't some banks favor fossil fuel companies with favorable lending rates? I can't speak to that. I will say that a lot of banks have been going deeper into fossil fuel lending, which is why I'm really worried about them, especially the Canadian banks. Uh, I do have a lot of concerns there. So I don't think they've got favorable lending rates. It wouldn't surprise me if the Canadian banks were a little more open to it, that they knew the sector better than their American counterparts. But, you know, everything that I'm seeing is that the, the energy G sector companies uh, cost of capital has been going up. So, you know, so basically here, let me just get rid of this. Oops. And that should be companies. Yeah. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see the energy, you know, whether uh, their cost of capital has been going up, uh, you know, but my guess is that it has been here's. Yeah. I saw this article a little while ago. Um, as I was doing the research for this, that really, you know, this is from whatever, Petroleum Economist. This is by no means like a green source. And what they're telling me is that capital costs are rising. On, and they would say here that the sector's weighted average cost of capital, WAC, that's the acronym that we use, that this is growing, that it's rising. And this causes valuation derating, reduced capital availability, low market liquidity. So I would suggest that this is not, uh, uh, you know, that I don't think Canadian banks are giving them uh, 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 priority financing. Uh, so, sorry, uh, yes, uh, ESG, I can clarify that. Uh, environmental social governance. So ESG, environmental social governance rating. I did cover this a little while ago. Thank you, Colin, for that. I really appreciate it. Uh, okay, IA Clarington Enhanced Global Equity SRI Class. So IA Clarington, I think they've now divested all of their funds. Uh, IA Clarington, it's uh, Enhanced Divest. I think they're all now fossil fuel free. Yeah, look at this, November 2019. So uh, IA Clarington has announced that all of their mandates in the IA Clarington Enhanced SRI Suite uh, are now fossil fuel free. Hooray, this is awesome. This is a huge win. I love it. So when I look at this enhanced global equity SRI class, really my issue with it is going to be the fees. This management expense ratio, 2.5%. Oh my goodness, 2.5%. Again, if you want to buy this mutual fund, no problem. But I would suggest you figure out how to buy it online or get me to help you buy it online so that if we can buy the Series F, look at this. It cuts the fees like in half. I want to be clear that the difference between the F series and the A series, all it is, it's the same fund. It's just the trailing commission that you pay to your advisor. So this is how your advisor normally gets paid. Whereas if you pay me by the hour as a coach, I can teach you how to buy it online by the F series. It's going to save you over a percent per year in fees. Uh, but I do like this fund. I've got no issues with it. It is fossil fuel free. So I do feel good about this. 
Uh, IA Clarington, the way they've done it is they hired Van City Investment Management, and I really love Van City. They're doing some really, really cool stuff here. Um, okay, let me wrap up my, uh, so I talked about these portfolios. I think that's really about it for me. I'll throw my contact info, info up here. Um, just in case you do need to get a hold of me, we've already jumped into Q and A, so I'm really happy to uh, uh, go into any more questions that you do have. Uh, I would say like now is the time where I'm happy to just jump in. If you want me to like, I can show you how I look at mutual funds. So for example, um, when it comes to that IA Clarington fund. It can be a bit of a pain in the butt to get the uh, holdings that here you can see they give the top 25, which is okay. Look, Amazon in here. Interesting that Amazon would be in here. Uh, I'm just curious. I think MSCI, you know, that Amazon, I think it's a pretty poor ESG rating. I'm just curious here. Amazon, let me just see. So yeah, double B, which is not very good. So that's kind of surprising to me. Let me just look it up on Yahoo Finance as well, because it might be different here, Amazon. So if we look it up on Yahoo Finance, which is Sustainalytics, again, 57th percentile. So it is here, a lower score is better. So very, very interesting there. Um, so, you know, to me, it's curious that they do have that. Uh, if you want the full list of holdings, this is just the top, uh, 25 holdings. If you want the full list, I do know a trick. You can do this for any mutual fund. You can go inside their documents and look at their regulatory documents. Now, I never know whether the annual or the semi-annual is the most recent. So this is March 31st. This is September 30th. So it's going to be this semi-annual one is the most recent, and we'll probably get a new annual report soon. But this is going to be a snapshot of uh, 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 this IA Clarington Global Equity Fund on this date. So they only have to publish these documents every six months, but they do have to publish them every six months. Uh, and where is it? Here we go. So let me zoom in here so that you can see. But what I've got here is I've got a snapshot of the total holdings of this IA Clarington Enhanced Global Equity Fund. So you can see here Brookfield Renewable Energy Partners Amazon, Home Depot, Starbucks, VF, Church and Dwight. This is like Arm & Hammer brand. Uh, Costco, Post Holdings, right? Black. So it's very interesting. I love that I'm able to get these holdings, but you do have to sort through the annual and semi-annual financial reports with mutual funds. It's not gonna be like ETFs where I can just click twice and like view holdings, show all, and get the full amount. Um, really, when it comes to mutual funds, you are going to have to dig through this list of holdings, um, which is kind of what I do, which is why I can tell you that the, you know, this one, this I Clarington Enhance, I do like it. Whereas, let me just show you NEI, because I know that came up before. Uh, so where was it here? I think I had it here. Products. Uh, hold on. If I do regulatory fund financials. I think this is where I get it. And I'm looking for their annual or their semi-annual. Hold on, I just wanna see if, uh, fun fact, investment, here we go. Summary of investment portfolio. Let me look, see if I can get it quickly. The global equity, and here's the global equity fund. And let me see if I can get it here. Uh, no, it's not on this one. Here we go. Summary of investment portfolio. So this is going to be the NEI Global Equity Fund. And annoying, this is just the top 25. So it's not even going to give me all of them. But even if I look at the top 25, ConocoPhillips, Nestle, Honeywell. Honeywell does have a lot of military contracts. Uh, TC Energy, this is TransCanada. This is Philip Morris International, oof. So now I don't know if this is their global equity. I don't know if this is the responsible one. So let me just see if they do, it might be in there. No, you know, this is the global equity. 
and that it is in the same section as the environmental leaders. So you can see why NEI, I mean, Philip Morris in there, TransCanada in there, oh, I'm not very happy about that. So this is why NEI for me, I don't love it. Uh, okay, let me get a couple questions here. Yeah, so you can no longer buy the F-Series for the IA Clarington Fund via Quest Trade. Uh, not sure why, but they transferred me out of Series F after I purchased them. Duncan, I know this happened. This was such a pain. You can still buy it through other platforms sometimes. Basically, they have to sign this like F-Series agreement. And so, uh, uh, you know, really it's annoying. Each mutual fund company does it with each one. Uh, Kim, you want to look at environmental leaders? Sure. Let me see if I can get it. Um, but really, you know, in my mind, uh, 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 this is why I prefer ETFs, that we just don't have to screw around with understanding whether we can at each platform. Um, so, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if we could buy it through other platforms, but through Questrade, for whatever reason, IA Clarington and Questrade, they just terminated that F-Series agreement. I bugged them on it. I tried to get that resolved and I just couldn't. And then now there are fossil fuel free ETFs. So I'm not even gonna bother doing this. Uh, Onana asks, is diluted a bad word when used in an earning reports? For example, diluted earnings per share. So no, it's not a bad, bad deal. When you're diluting shares, you're just issuing more shares. Uh, oftentimes what you're looking at here is they will split it up between shares that are traded on the market. And there might be like private shares for like founders of the company, people who owned it. So diluted earnings per shares, I really wouldn't worry about this. Certainly not a bad word. Uh, Colin, if you're not happy with investing in Canadian banks uh, because of the role they play in financing energy projects, what can you do? So obviously we can look at uh, uh, banks outside of the US or outside of Canada rather. So there are gonna be some ETFs there. Uh, in terms of exposure for the US, you, know, you, you don't, don't want, want the, the big banks, banks in the US either. There is a small cap financials uh, ETF uh, that I've looked at. So uh, where is it here? It's from, uh, F I wanna say it's FPSC. Let me just see if this is right. See how I am with it? No, that was wrong. Uh, um, small cap financials. Let's see if I spell ETF right. Um, ETF DB, yes, this one. But yeah, it's from Invesco, here it is. So this is the Invesco S&P small cap financials ETF. So these are gonna be small cap uh, uh, US uh, uh, financials. Banks, there are gonna be REITs in here, insurance, thrift and mortgage finance, I don't love these. These are gonna be like payday lenders and things like that. So it might not be great. Um, but if we look at it in here, you know, it's going to be a lot of community banks, eHealth, okay, Glacier, Bancorp. So these are going to be a lot more sort of local, smaller U.S. banks. And what's kind of cool is that it has performed about the same as the large cap ones. So if I do like IXG, which is the global financials ETF, right, I can show you the chart over the last, uh, uh, why don't we do the last five years here? Um, I might have to zoom out a little bit to get the date. No, I can get it in here. So you can see financials have taken a really big hit, haven't bounced back up as much as some other sectors. I can now compare it to the, shoot, what was that uh, ETF? Uh, the ticker symbol PSCF, that was close. PSCF, um, oh, it's not popping up, F, here we go. And I'll make this one purple so that you can see it. And you can see that it has tracked it pretty closely. The small cap has actually outperformed the, the global financial. So obviously it's not as diversified, much more focused on the US economy, which right now I might be a little bit more cautious about, but I would suggest you, uh, uh, you know, if you didn't want the big banks, this would be a way of doing small cap banks. Um, or, you know, you can look at some individual companies uh, uh, you know, and, and kind of pick and choose the ones that you want. Um, do I have a good um, good emerging market ETF that's fossil fuel free? Cal, this has been so hard. Uh, point blank, no, I don't have an emerging market that is explicitly fossil fuel free. Um, the closest one is not just emerging markets, but it is mostly emerging markets, is the iShares MSCI Global Impact ETF. 
So this is SDG. Uh, it's linked to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which is kind of cool. So the way it works is that there is an ESG, minimum ESG score. So it's got to have strong socially conscious practices, but also build their business around products and services that may drive positive change. So this is kind of a cool way of sort of doing more good. When we get into the doing more good options, you know, I can show you uh, uh, sort of what's in here, Gilead Sciences, Procter & Gamble, East Japan Railway. So again, you know, it's gonna have uh, uh, no exposure to energy and it's gonna have more exposure to healthcare, obviously sustainable development goals and, uh, you know, consumer staples and then industrials, which are gonna be a lot of the green sectors. And what I can do is look this up on Morningstar just to double check. Oh, I didn't show you the emerging markets, sorry. That it does have exposure to China here, uh, right? Other, uh, uh, Belgium, Hong Kong, South Korea. If you look at it, it does have India, Brazil, Mexico. So they are all gonna be in here. So emerging markets are inside. And that I can confirm, I think, that it's got, yeah, fossil fuel involvement, very, very low. So not 100%. It's always going to be really hard to get that down to exactly zero. But this would be sort of like low carbon, almost fossil fuel free. Uh, okay. Any thoughts on breaking up with your long-term advisor to invest online? Yeah. Uh, do it. Do it. Uh, I'm a big believer in it. I mean, it depends. Some advisors are good. Some are like, they, they give you attention and they're worth their fees it's very rare that they're actually worth their fees. So Leslie, I am totally biased. I have built an entire business around breaking up, helping people break up with their long-term advisor. Um, but to me, it's like, you know, are they listening to you? And are they giving you what you want? And really, is it worth the fees that you're paying them? And if they're not listening to you and they're not giving you what they want, like I've heard about so many advisors that when people bringing up divestment or these other issues, they just like kind of dismiss it or they talk down to you or they like warn you that you're going to like, you know, lose all your money, even though these things have outperformed. So, you know, really to me, it's like if they're open to it and they are providing value and they are helping you, then stay with them. But if they're not, or if you just want to save the fees, then I would absolutely go through that process of breaking up with them. Um, this is what I do. This is what I help people do. So if you're finding it intimidating, just book a free consultation with me. I'm more than happy to kind of walk you through what that would look like. At the end of the day, just to be clear, you don't have to like tell them. What you would do is like start a new relationship with an online broker. So you'd like create your accounts at Questrade and then you're going to request the transfer from your advisor. So they're going to get a letter from Questrade that requires them to authorize that transfer on your behalf. I usually suggest writing a little like courtesy email to be like, thanks for all your help, but I've decided to go DIY. Um, you know, realistically, a lot of them are, uh, uh, a lot of the uh, 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 advisors are hearing about the shift to DIY. So I think a lot of them kind of see the writing on the wall, know that it's coming. And specifically, if you do want to uh, uh, switch to DIY, then, you know, like, they'll understand. So I really wouldn't worry about it. You know, you can preserve the relationship, even if they're a friend. You know, I've often helped clients sort of write that email, but it is a very legitimate decision to be able to shift to DIY. Um, okay, environmental leaders, I'll come back to this, but I do want to address this question, which is, uh, what is the reputation of MD management as advisors? So this has changed. Uh, Megan, I think you bring up a really interesting question. And, um, you know, for the longest time, MD management, I held them in such high esteem as advisors because they were truly independent. They weren't advisors selling you these A-series funds and getting the trailing commissions. Instead, they were more like consultants. And my understanding is that they were on salary. And as a result, because they were on salary, they had no skin in the game. They weren't selling you products and earning commissions or trailers. Now, what's happened is that Scotiabank um, has bought MD management. And I don't know the full ins and outs of this, 
but you can see March last year that MD management got bought by Scotiabank. Now, what they're doing is they're saying that MD will operate as a distinct standalone brand within Scotiabank, but I'm starting to hear from clients, from MD management clients, that you know hasn't been as good. Now you'll see here, you'll continue to join the objective expert and physician-centered advice you've always trusted, right? So they're saying that they're gonna do this, but I'm starting to hear that you know some people feel like they are being sold products. I can't speak to this. I don't know if there are other people on the chat that are with MD management that have experienced a little bit of a, a culture shift at all. But I do think that it's gonna be a little bit tricky. I'm just curious what this little uh, turnover rate remains below the average, okay. So, you know, they're saying that they're gonna keep things as is, that it'll always be this objective, you know, that the fees are gonna remain low. I'm just not so sure. And that really in my mind, you know, when it comes to the reputation, absolutely, I think they're good people doing good work, that they're, they're great when it comes to the insurance and, you know, setting up corporations and the tax structure and like all those different things. When it comes to the investment side, my understanding is that they do sort of push the MD branded products. And this is common occurrence in the investment industry that the MD products are very good products but you know i would say that the md fossil fuel free fund is you know in my mind not the best let me just show you fossil fuel free equity fund so here we go if i want to get inside of it uh, what i need to do is get the regulatory documents so these are going to be the financial statements uh, this one is what's the date on it uh, December 31st, 2019. So this will probably be the most recent one, I'm assuming. Yep. So here we go. Uh, oh, independent auditor's report. Forgive me. Okay, here we go. Fossil fuel free equity fund. So it's got alcohol in here. Uh, Anheuser-Busch, not a big deal. But what this tells me is that they don't use these socially responsible guidelines of getting rid of the quote unquote sin stocks of alcohol, tobacco, weapons, those other things. When I had conversations with them, they were really, really focused on getting rid of fossil fuels. That was their mandate. They said, we're gonna do this. We're gonna be really, really good at it. What it means is that they could own alcohol. I think tobacco is out of all MD products. I think that was a decision made a long time ago with the policy, but you can still get alcohol in here and I think you can still get weapons in here, okay? So for example, let me just see, I mean, there aren't too many things in here that I don't like, but let me just see here. Oh, here's Heineken, a little more alcohol in there. Um, and in United States, I just wanna see, so these companies here, and there was uh, Honeywell was in here when it started. It's not anymore, but it was in here when it started. So looking through this, it's like it's not awful, but I would say to my knowledge, they're not doing ESG or any type of socially responsible investing. That really the mandate here is very, very specifically to be fossil fuel free, which is fine. I've got no issues with it. But, you know, if you don't want alcohol or if you don't want weapons, you know, this is one where it could have this. And then, you know, for me, the, the issue is going to be more the fees. That if I look at the Series A and the Series F, and again, these are going to be cheaper than, than the fees at the big banks. But you can still see 1.6% for the A Series. The F Series, this is actually pretty cheap, you know, 0.54%. So I'll give them credit for that, that especially if you buy the Series F, you know, certainly wouldn't be the, the worst option. I'm just not so sure it's gonna be the best option. Uh, okay, from there, uh, I wonder why you really like the iClarenton Enhanced Global uh, SRI class, though it has some companies that are not so environmentally friendly or environmentally responsible in it. So the reason I like it is that this is what I would classify the iClarenton one. And again, I wanna make a real distinction here 
between the uh, 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 doing less evil versus doing more good. So this is a good example of what I would call a doing less evil fund, where the IA Clarington Enhanced Global Equity Fund, they're still getting global, multi-billion dollar, multinational companies. They're just getting rid of all the ones with the lowest ESG scores and all the alcohol, tobacco, weapons, and fossil fuels, which is why I like it. That to me is going to be a very standard doing less evil fund compared to the environmental leaders, which when we look at this one is going to be a lot cleaner. So hold on, let me get the NEI environmental leaders. I have way too many tabs open. So I'm just going to close a bunch of them until I get back to the NEI page. Here it is. When we look at the environmental leaders fund, you know, waste management, Schneider Electric, this is energy management, hardware, software, Suez, this is water infrastructure, you know, East Japan Railway, this is commuter rails, right? These are companies that are much more, I would say, sort of like doing more good, right? W compared to the doing less evil that would be in the, uh, uh, the other ones. So I just want to make that as a very clear distinction that in terms of any of the model portfolios, you know, what I do is uh, uh, I typically uh, carve out a specific amount. Where is it? In the squeaky clean here. So impact equity, you know, I did 20% here. In my organic couch potato, I've got green equity at 15% here. So again, you know, most of it should be this doing less evil. And we only want to carve out part of it for doing more good just because these do tend to be the, uh, uh, the sort of riskier options. Uh, okay, from there, can I find out how much lending from banks to fossil fuel industries? So uh, there was a report on this. Oops, sorry. Uh, let me go back to here. And it was from the Rainforest Action Network, fossil fuels banks. So they did a report a little while ago, uh, banking on climate change. Here we go. Uh, 2020 report. So it looks like this might be new. Let me download it. Here we go. So this is going to tell me how much banks have put into fossil fuels. Um, it should give me the summary. Hold on. Here we go. This is it. So this tells me how much they put into fossil fuels over the last four years. JP Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo City, Bank of America, and the Canadian banks will be up there. RBC, TD, Scotiabank, right uh on the next page cibc so the big five are going to be very very heavily invested when it comes to fossil fuels this is going to be your best resource here here if you want i can put this into the chat just so that you've got it um let me do this here we go beautiful oops ah sorry no not fun there we go cool Okay, so uh, that's going to be the best resource there. Uh, okay, yeah, MDM just use their platform for direct investment. They use Qtrade, that's right. MDM, you can just, you don't even have to break up with your advisor. You can just be like, hey, I want to use the direct investment platform. Um, and that F-Series can't be purchased as a DIY, only the D funds. Oh, interesting, F-Series, you pay assets under management fees to MDM. Oh, that's so interesting that they push you into the D funds and that the F series that I think the way this would work is if you are on a fee-based model, you would still pay your advisor. So that's very, very fascinating to me that let me just see here if I can do MD, for example, fossil fuel, that they do have the D series and the D, what's the fee on the D series? 0 0.64. So a little more expensive than the F series, but Really with these mutual funds, it drives me nuts, all these different series. I don't want to get too deep into it. Um, but uh, uh, you know, you do want to be aware of which series that you're buying. It sounds like, thank you, Gail, that the hot tip would be that if you did want to buy them yourself, you could buy the D series, which would still save you quite a bit. Oh, that's the bond fund. Hold on. Sorry. Equity. Uh, here we go for the equity fund 1.22 so it is a little more expensive still going to be cheaper than the a series but you're not going to save as much money 
as you would. Uh, the F series, it'd be interesting to know if you could buy it anywhere else. At one of the other brokers, you might have to switch the broker to get the F series, but it looks like the D series, you would save a little bit of money. Um, okay, uh, Ona, I can address gold. So I just don't know. In terms of gold, I don't like it. I just, I'm not a fan of commodities. A lot of environmental issues with gold. Um, if you want to, if you want to learn about gold, uh, there is a woman I follow uh, on Twitter, Anita Sharma. Uh, she's a host on Market Call. So I've been on her a little bit and she's been tweeting a lot about gold and I think she's got some experts. So, you know, what I would suggest is maybe sort of follow her. Um, I don't know if she's done anything recently, but she does speak to a number of gold experts and that, you know, she would likely have a, a much better idea of the gold market than I would. <sighs> oh my goodness, it's 8.45. I've been doing this for an hour and 45 Five minutes now. I feel like the questions are starting to dry up. Did I miss any questions? Is there any other questions that people do have? I feel like I'm about ready to call it a night, that this has been awesome. I've had a lot of fun. The engagement here has been amazing. I hope this has been helpful for you as well. Um, let me know. I'm just going to let the leg catch up with the chat window. If you do have any more questions, now's your chance. If you've been on the sidelines waiting and with a question but not wanting to ask, now is, I would say, your last chance to ask me a question. Great presentation. Thank you so much. My heart is so warm that, uh, uh, you know, so many people tuned in. Uh, I don't know what the numbers were, but this was hopefully very helpful. Uh, I want to let people know if they, uh, if they found this useful, I am doing these every week. So you can uh, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, you can like ring the little bell. I think there's a little thing that'll get you the notifications. Um, when I do go live, I tend to do uh, every two weeks, or sorry, every week uh, uh, at 7 p.m. Toronto time on Thursdays is kind of the time I'm aiming for. Um, you know, really uh, thank you so much for attending. Uh, Simon, you can give me a call. That's no problem. I will always take your calls. Um, I, I will be covering other topics in the future. Um, I'm really hoping to do a full episode on impact investing getting a lot of feedback from that. I would love to do one on investing in, in on the green side. Oh, you missed my dog. She's been down here. You haven't even noticed her. Let me see, hold on. I, I can't, I need to get the webcam. So I'm gonna go like this so that I can see a little bit. Oh, that's with the leg. So hold on, let me get this. Yeah, there she is. So you should be able to see her there. She has been peaceful and quiet lying there this whole time. Uh, I can't tell you how awesome it is to have that dog. Um, uh, uh, so Ronald, I will definitely give her little scritches for you. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, COVID going forward. Yeah, a long time came, you're probably right. We'll have lots of time to talk about this in future episodes. Uh, thank you so much everyone uh, for, for staying with me. I really appreciate it. Uh, keep doing awesome things. Thank you so much to the work that you're doing, to the doctors that have been on this. Um, and uh, have a great week, and I'll see everybody next week. All the best. Bye-bye.